So I have some slides. You know, I think I want to talk a little bit about technology and how things I see are going to change in, in the long view in the next, you know, next 50 years or so, and then back up into what, so what needs to happen in the next five years or so. Um, but before I do that, I thought I would um, talk a little bit about how far we have come, because sometimes when we talk about the future, it's hard to predict, as was pointed out earlier, and no one's predictions ever turn out to be right. Um, however, and sometimes it sounds like science fiction when you talk about drones and autonomous cars and machines that can think in the IoT world and ingestible sensors that are going to keep track of our body uh, chemistry, biochemistry, all of this sounds like science fiction. And in many ways, actually, I think science fiction pr uh, prompts us as inventors to create things, right? We want to create that future. Um, so I think I want to just set some context to say where were we 50 years ago and how far we've come so that when I do talk about the future, it doesn't sound so much like science fiction. Last week, I was in China before I came here. I think for the first time, I really feel companies have an opportunity to be created um, not only in the U.S. brought here or in India going there, but created simultaneously in multiple countries, so to speak, right? In Silicon Valley, in India, in China, all at the same time. Uh, so that's the third change that's happening at the moment, which was different from the past decades of changes that are going on. So I'm going to talk about technology and business landscape changes. So, but before I do that, you know, I want to kind of look back and say how far we have come. As I said, it's sort of like credibility to say how far we can go, right? So what happened in the last, uh, you know, six, in the 1960s, for example, we were still working on figuring out uh, with NASA how to send mission, a landed mission to the moon. And just last month in September, NASA announced that they now have found uh, evidence of intermittent liquid flow on, on Mars. So from going, thinking about really having the compute power to send someone to the moon to really discovering evidence of water, right? You know, that's a huge amount of progress in just a short period of time. Back then, you know, in the 60s, ARPANET and the network protocol were being created, right? You know, it was really the foundation for the internet. And this is data from Cisco. Cisco expects that by 2019, there'll be more than 4 billion people, internet users, so more than half the world will be using internet. So huge amount of opportunity yet, because many applications haven't been created for when those people come online. And it's not just that, actually, there'll be many more network devices. So this is IoT, right? And the connection of devices, but it's not just a sensor networks and what happens in sensor networks, but what will happen when that data combines with all those people that are coming online? And by the way, these people are not coming online at low bandwidth. They're coming online with a minimum of one, minimum of one megabits per second kind of bandwidth. So it's, it is a lot of bandwidth to push video content and other things that I know Shraddha was talking about this morning. There'll be a lot of opportunity to do things very differently. So that's the next change. The other thing is basic. In the 60s, computers couldn't be programmed and, and until a language called basic was invented. And you know, think about how far we've come today. Actually, US Census Bureau says that computer programming is the one job category that will continue to grow. Again, in the 60s, uh, New York Welfare uh, demonstrated, if we actually did some research for this, GE was showcasing the first television. Kodak was introducing Kodachrome. <laughs> you know, many of you probably haven't even heard of this. And the first Mod 1 picture phone was being demonstrated at the time. And the tagline for the New York Welfare in the 60s was they were developing technology for the new space age because the Apollo mission was being launched then, right? And today, we do all of that with one, one device called the smartphone. We take pictures, we send videos, we do FaceTime, Hangouts, whatever. All of that is integrated into one device. So with that context of how far we have come, what will the next you know, big changes be? And here I've tried to take a look based on different verticals, because I think when we talk about change, it feels like it's overwhelming unless we talk about specific industries. So I've picked a few industries that I feel will be you know, depending on your perspective, disrupted dramatically or changed dramatically, right? If you're an incumbent, you'll see this as a disruption. And if you're an innovator, you'll see, that as a, see it as an opportunity. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is transportation. I think if you think about the way we move people, fundamentally really hasn't changed. And this has been my pet peeve. Automobiles really haven't changed from the time they were invented except for maybe leather seats, 
instead of plastic seats, and a better kind of infotainment system where you can finally now with Bluetooth take your device and have listen to your music that you want instead of whatever the radio station is playing. Other than that, fundamentally, there's not been any innovation in an automobile. So transportation, I feel, is ripe for change. Everything will change, in my view, in transportation, starting from what we will drive with the electric vehicles displacing gas mobiles. Um, you know, I heard a statistic, I don't remember who told me this, somebody told me this today. In Bangalore, there are 400 new vehicle owners that are coming on every day. And you know, Shanghai, Beijing, these are all going through the same issues. So it's not only an environmental issue, it's actually uh, a fuel, availability of fuel. That, I think electric vehicles, my, my prediction is that they'll become mainstream. Um, in the next you know, 10 to 20 years. Autonomous vehicles will gain prominence. May not be a fully autonomous car that can drive itself like Google is working on, but perhaps certain elements of that, right? Like Tesla just introduced some parts of it. So I think that will start to become uh, much more prominent. And by the way, this is, is not only just the transportation industry, but it will impact industries associated with that. There are several companies in Silicon Valley now that are actually disrupting car insurance because of this, right? If you think about how insurance models work, automotive ins insurance is a high, high, um, you know, high value uh, sector today. But when we have autonomous cars or cars that actually have a lot more compute capabilities and eventually we have vehicle to vehicle communication, then the accidents are going to come down, so insurance companies are going to get disrupted. So there are companies like Zendrive and other startups that collect data uh, with the smartphone phones that people use when they're driving and supply that information to insurance companies. So there's associated industries in transportation that will also get disrupted. Um, and you know, traffic de delays and things of this, again, this is where IoT comes in with smart traffic lights and smart metering. Um, that'll, with that, we'll be able to predict uh, traffic jams. And, and just to prove that all of this is not that far away, IBM actually just announced that they can use archived data, roadside sensors, GPS, and be able to predict a traffic jam up to an hour to two hours before it occurs. Robotics is another area that I feel like there will be a lot going on. Um, and by the way, this isn't just, I mean, there's a huge debate, especially in Silicon Valley now, if you go read any of the blogs on whether robots are going to take away jobs and what does that mean. Um, and you know, then you combine that with AI and you know, there's a big debate on is artificial intelligence good for us or bad for us. And there's whole ethical questions on creating machines that can sense and feel. So there's a lot of debate happening. However, there is also a big emerging field called biomimicry where we are actually able to create machines that can mimic um, biological way we think about things. And I think that will inspire whole new sets of abilities. And already we are seeing that combined again with the changing demographic that the world in, in general is aging and there'll be a lot of aging population that will need to be looked after. So we'll hope we will soon see uh, robots for nursing applications and things of this sort. So when we think of robots, the general uh, notion will simply be, are robots going to replace workers in factories? And so what's going to happen? And you know, our job's going to get less, et cetera. But there's also an aspirational way that perhaps we'll be able to care for aging population in a better way using robotics that have biomimicry capabilities. And if you look at the number, by 2045, there'll be a lot more older people. And so in the world in general, India is actually going to be one of the few countries with a younger population. Uh, and again, Purdue University is already working on this, and they're developing robots for nursing. So these, these technologies are going to get commercialized very quickly here, and that's the point of what we will see. Uh, the next is connected bodies, and this is my favorite. You know, I think when we talk about sensors and IoT, most people today think about wearables, right? Fitbit, fuel, Nike fuel band, the things that we wear as bracelets that are going to keep track of what we do. But there's a whole field emerging in connected bodies with sensors inside our body. Um, and I think that's fascinating to think about. They may be tiny sensors with ingestible chips, and this is maybe a hardware software kind of innovation, again, that can keep track of our weight and tell us um, and give us input to do uh, to live a healthy lifestyle. The problem with the wearables today, um, and I've tried all of them and I've stopped wearing all of them after a certain point, is that after the fact, you wear a Fitbit 
uh, or any of your favorite band, and it keeps track of your steps, and it tells you at the end of the day whether you did your steps or not. But you know that if you went to the gym and ran or walked around because there was a traffic jam in Bangalore, you know you'll get your steps. If you didn't do that, you won't. So it really isn't changing anything in my behavior other than giving me information after the fact. And so there'll be technology developments with other kinds of sensors that will make that uh, a more proactive thing. And again, by the way, already we are working on some of these things where scientists are working and looking at sensors to monitor vital signs and so forth. The big question in this field is really not technology, but regulation. And how quickly will the medical industry adopt some of these things? We'll see an intersection of uh, technologists and innovators coming from other areas into the healthcare area. So it's not healthcare. When we think about healthcare and technology, typically we think of healthcare IT, digitization of medical records and stuff like that. I think that's the first wave, and we'll see a whole next wave coming with things like more in genomics and screening techniques and things of that sort that'll, that'll drive innovation in, in the next decade or so. Uh, the next is medi medical technology itself. 3D printing, and now there are startups uh, thinking about, and I think actually this is a huge area of opportunity for India to think about 3D printing and how you can enable 3D printing to provide not just in medical fields, but spare parts and industry, uh, you know, because spare parts is a huge business in India, I know, because people here, we you know, we reuse things a lot more, and so there could be other applications. But specifically in the medical field, people are looking at 3D printing certain elements of biocompatible organs. Um, so, and there are, there's work going on even in looking at live cells as ink. And you know, if you print these kinds of things, you can actually augment certain things that we can do. And what I found was interesting is, there's now research that, that's happening to look at genome se sequencing even before a, a baby is born. And obviously there's eth ethical questions to it, but you can use that technology to pre-screen for high-risk um, you know, high diseases uh, before a, a child is born. So there's a lot happening in the medical field. And of course, Internet of Everything, which, which um, was something that we were working on, the world is now talking about. Again, it's not really about just connecting devices, but it's actually connecting the devices and the data with people and processes. Um, and you know, Cisco's estimates say it's about $19 trillion of value. Uh, so you can think of it as a sensor economy. Um, so there'll be a lot of app applications here in the agriculture field, for example, for food production, for distribution, for logistic optimization, for manufacturing optimization, pretty much every vertical. And there's lots of solutions that are being developed here. Um, this next one is what I call contextual knowledge. And so this is, feels like machine learning. And so you can think of the, applying these almost in every area, right? And if you're collecting information, we met a startup this, uh, af this morning that's looking at um, connecting the job market with the candidates. So over time, you can think of applying a lot more machine learning techniques to optimize that kind of an algorithm, where based on the matching and what people are selecting, there's a lot we can do. So if you think about machine learning and AI, I, you know, we tend to think of it as technologies, but I actually think there'll be applications driven for, from it over time. So now, up until now, the tech industry globally has really worked only on using resources from nature and not replenishing that, and is that trend going to reverse or not? And it's a great question, right? You know, in general, if you think about technology industry, from the physical electronics industry, which we feel has not done enough to create sustainable environment, to how now we are using power, data centers consuming a lot more power, I mean, it does feel like the tech industry is more to blame than to be given credit for in protecting the environment. But I think if you look at food, for example, I do feel technology can apply, be applied in the next decade to optimize food production, not just distribution. So far, we've you know, worked on technology more in the distribution side, and there's a lot more to be done there. So vertical farming for very highly congested cities like Bangalore, like Delhi, like Beijing, like Shanghai, like Chicago, may be the wave in the future. All right, so that's sort of like looking far ahead, and I think some of these things may take 20, 30 years to become a reality, although there is work going on now. So I want to just bring it closer and say, okay, what do we think, what do I think will happen in the next five years, and what are the spaces that I feel there's still a lot 
of innovation left for us to do, right? And so I picked out of that, you know, certain things that I feel will be critical. So cloud, I still think, is very nascent still. Um, and cloud meaning not just the technology of virtualizing data centers and distributing the compute and, and the storage um, and, you know, things of that infrastructure, virtualization, but really more about what does that enable us to do on the application side. And so there's still a lot more B2B uh, opportunity in the cloud space. And I think so far cloud has really disrupted more the B2C uh, kind of implementation, right? And a lot of innovation in the cloud came actually from B2C companies or, or consumer internet companies. And now we need to figure out how to apply that into the traditional enterprise space. Same thing with mobile. I still feel mobile is still fairly nascent. There are very few native mobile companies and I think we'll see more companies get created natively on the mobile space going forward. Security is huge, um, is a challenge and an opportunity. I think the model for security will change quite dramatically and perhaps, and, and maybe I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, I think if you look at security, traditionally we built firewalls and we, fill, we built data security and network security technologies, right? And that worked in a perimeter-based model when you had a client and a server, you could sec secure the desktop and you could secure the server. But as the world is changing and we go to Internet of Things, we really have to be thinking about security. The perimeter for attack is increasing uh, dramatically, right? You know, so how do you secure things? So security in the future, my expectation is it'll sort of become like a platform with APIs almost where you can integrate newer technologies to prevent attacks onto that platform versus replacing the whole platform every few years. Because the sophistication at which hackers are going to hack is going to go also in a rapid way. So I have to think about innovating newer solutions faster. As all of you as entrepreneurs are thinking about creating new applications, new capabilities, think about the vulnerabilities that your application will be exposed to. So it's not just a privacy issue, but actually, you know, what kind of security hacks can we think through? I talked about transportation. Shifting services offline to online is, I think, still a big opportunity. Um, especially, I think I've seen in India, I think there's a big movement here. But even in the Valley, I think you know, a lot of things like even grocery delivery, you know. And this last one's also my favorite, uh, learning. And uh, if I were to do a startup, I'd probably do one in this space. You know, if you think, kind of think about it, right, education. We spend so much effort when we're in high school trying to get into the best colleges. Um, and once you get into a college, you spend so much effort trying to finish college so you can get your degree and start a company. But once you start working, all of the learning's really left up to you, right? You're expected to figure out how you're going to progress in your career, uh, whether it's you know, sharpening your managerial skills or learning new content. Um, you know, how do you learn once you start working? It's really up to you. You observe others, you talk to others, you go to, you know, go to conferences. There's no systematic way where we deliver learning once we leave college. I think in the future that'll change dramatically, right? Your phone gets a software update. Your, increasingly your car will be getting software updates, but your brain truly never gets an update. Um, so there'll be ways that we will disrupt that part of it going forward where you'll be able to learn in a continuous mode. So now I, with, and I want to do a caveat here, I haven't lived in India or worked in India really full time for a number of years, but I do know a lot about the market here. So what I've done is looked at what I see around the world, um, because I do travel quite a bit around the world, I look at investments and startups and big companies around the world, and try to say what applies to what I know about India. So take what I've got uh, here with a bit of a grain of salt, but I feel like this is my top 10. You know, if I feel like what could be opportunities for innovation in India, what would be my top 10 list? Uh, this would be my top 10 list. I think there's a lot of opportunity here in India still for cloud. I think cloud basically not just creating like what telecoms here are doing like AWS, providing infrastructure as a service, but actually creating applications uh, to support that cloud, right? You know, data center cooling technologies, for example, or, or sub-technologies that go into making cloud. I think India still has a lot of opportunity to invent and innovate there. And mobile, I think, is, is, is hot here, but I think there's still a lot more companies that can be started that are mobile first. Um, fintech and services, you know, I think there's a lot in the payment space, but even beyond payment, there's additional things we can, like fintech, for example, I would um, in, introduce things like 
again, you know, in India but serving a global market would be things like disrupting in insurance models, disrupting data collection for insurance companies that are global insurance companies, right? Again, transportation, again, I feel there's a big opportunity here to change education and skills. Um, the analytics, but analytics, I think, is very vertical specific, very application specific. So there's analytics within the application, but there's analytics platforms also that will become important. Uh, healthcare, again, not health IT, but actually doing things like that are more screening and, and fitness oriented better ways, giving people information about what they're eating so they'll eat better, that sort of thing, is what I mean by healthcare. Agriculture and food I talked about. I didn't touch today on what I call smart machines, right? There's a big shift again in the valley toward maker movement. So this is really, um, and my husband likes this because he's a hardware guy. You know, for a long time, I would say in the last 10 years, hardware became less important as software became more important. And Mark Andreessen talks about software eating the world. But I think now there's a revolution back again where hardware is becoming important. But hardware in a different way, with 3D printing, with drones, with robotics, with more automation, um, that are more systems, right? You know, these are systems that have hardware and software. So I think India has an opportunity. And I talked to Prime Minister Modi when he was in Silicon Valley. He wants every company to build manufacturing in India. Um, however, maybe that manufacturing has to target what will be coming versus manufacturing cell phones or routers. I think that market is already kind of gone, and it'll be tough for companies to shift manufacturing from China to here, but India has an opportunity to say, let's build the next drone here, let's build the next robot here. So I think this should be, a, you know, maybe this is input for Kalari, there should be like a small maker movement here to look at uh, smart machines and how do we start gaining the capability to build smart machines in India, right? You know, that could, that's what I mean here. And then 3D printing. 3D printing can be anything. I think you should target it toward, I think, spare parts or something like that where there is a, there's a need for having the right part at the right time and lowering the cost. So those are my thoughts and uh, I think that's all I had. I don't know if uh, I went through it fairly quickly. But we'll take questions. Yeah.